Well, good morning, everyone. It is uh, just two after, and we want to go ahead and get started. I see something in the chat. Um, Shannon, uh, sending love to you and your furry family. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today. So good, in, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Happy Pride. Um, I appreciate you all making time to join us because um, while we just celebrated Pride weekend uh, for many of us for the first time in a few years, this unfortunately has not been a great week for justice. Um, I'm of course talking about Friday's Supreme Court decision overturning Roe and ignoring almost 50 years of legal precedent. And this is also marking the first time in history that the Supreme Court has taken away a fundamental right. My name is Imani Rupert Gordon. My pronouns are she, her, and hers, and I'm the executive director for the National Center for Lesbian Rights. We are a legal organization that works to achieve and advance civil and human rights for all LGBTQ people and our families. If we can't decide how, if, and when to be pregnant, we don't have control of our bodies. This is a question of freedom and equity, and it will become an issue of access and economic justice. We've already heard from so many LGBTQ leaders, they are coming for us next. And that's wrong because they're coming for us now. The right to an abortion is an LGBTQ issue. It will affect LGBTQ people. And those that don't see that are ignoring the interests of women, transgender and non-binary people in the LGBTQ movement. In addition, that short-sighted thinking will affect all folks hitting LGBTQ people, people of color, people with low incomes, and the most underrepresented identities the hardest. We have to remember that our movements are interconnected and our response has to be an intersectional one. If it's not, we'll alienate those fighting along with us and we won't need our opponent to divide us because we'll do it ourselves. This is near to us at NTLR because not only is this what needs to be done, this is what NTLR has always done. NCLR was the first LGBTQ legal advocacy organization that was founded with a gender justice perspective. And so while um, others don't understand the intersections between LGBTQ equality and reproductive justice, this has been a core of our work for years. Most recently, NCLR led the LGBTQ amicus brief in the Dobbs versus Jackson Women's Health Organization. And right now, we're working with other national LGBTQ legal organizations on a response strategy. It's time for bold action and NCLR is not taking this moment lightly. The moment that we're in is a life changing one and this decision is disastrous. And it's given us some very clear insight into what the court and at least the most senior justice on the court is thinking and we will be taking that seriously. Justice Thomas explicitly expressed what he called a duty to correct the error established in those precedents. And he was specifically talking about Griswold, Lawrence, and Obergefell. And that means contraception, privacy, or consensual sex between adults, and marriage equality. He is absolutely signaling that he wants to hear cases that would undo these precedents. And we're already hearing from others like Utah Senate President Stuart Adams saying that he would support the Supreme Court reconsidering marriage equality. So we should absolutely be concerned. And we're holding this briefing to help you understand what happened on Friday and what that might mean for our community. Right now, we need to stay informed, we need to be brave, we need to be bold, and we need to be diligent. Providing some context about what, um, what's happened will be uh, Julie Gonen, NCLR's Federal Policy Director, and Shannon Mentor, NCLR's Legal Director. Julie, why don't you get us started? Thank you so much, Imani. And thank you everybody for being here today. I wish this weren't the reason that we're all convening, but I'm at least glad that we can be in community together today. So next January will be the 50th anniversary of Roe versus Wade, the case in which the Supreme Court held that the constitution protected the right to end a pregnancy. On Friday, this past Friday, in the case of Dobbs versus Jackson Women's Health Organization, the Supreme Court overturned Roe and held that the Constitution does not protect that right. Now, the court overruling itself is not unheard of. It does happen. 
But as Amani said, this is the first time that the court has reversed itself to take away rather than expand individual rights. To truly appreciate the significance of the Dobbs case, we really must understand Roe versus Wade in context. So the touchstone of this conversation is the guarantee of liberty in the 14th Amendment to the Constitution. Now, liberty is a broad and expansive term, and there are, are, there are alternative visions as to how to give meaning to the liberty right. One view, a more conservative view, is that only if a right is literally in the text of the Constitution, or it is deeply rooted in this nation's history and traditions, does it exist. A different, more progressive, more expansive view holds that rights evolve over time and that while history and tradition guide us, they do not set the outer boundaries of rights that exist in the Constitution. That view, fortunately, has led to a long line of cases enumerating fundamental rights that are not, in fact, found in the text of the Constitution. And it's very important at this moment that we situate Roe versus Wade within a long tradition of cases establishing liberty rights around things like relationships and sexual intimacy, procreation, family formation, child rearing, and bodily integrity. So I wanna just do like a really quick history of how cases around those issues have built upon each other leading up to Roe as well as since Roe. And you can look all the way back to the 1920s to cases uh, that the Supreme Court decided where they said that there is a liberty right in the constitution to form a family, to establish a home, rear children the way you see fit and direct their education. In 1942, the, the court held that procreation is a basic liberty and, and struck down uh, the right of states to involuntarily sterilize people. About 10 years later, the court expanded on this notion of bodily integrity and said that states couldn't literally pump the stomach of a prisoner in order to get evidence of drugs. Now, while this not, may not sound like it's super related to abortion, it is, and we'll get there. So in 1965, in a case that Amani touched on, the court decided the case of Griswold versus Connecticut. There, the court said that the, there's an implied right to privacy in that liberty right in the Constitution, and that means that states can't prevent married people from using contraception. A couple of years later, we saw the landmark decision of Loving versus Virginia, in which the court said that the Constitution, the liberty right in the Constitution includes the right to marry and struck down laws preventing interracial marriage. The court expanded on the right to contraception a few years later, saying it actually applies to individuals, not just married people. And what we see in each and every one of these cases is that they're citing the ones before. So even the, the case around, cases around contraception cited the child rearing cases, the, the, the involuntary ster sterilization cases. So it, there's a building and an accumulation of an understanding of basic personal freedom and, and rights. Then in 1973, we have the Roe case itself. And in that case, the court built on the contraception cases and said that the right to determine whether or not to become a parent includes the right to end a pregnancy. And it cited all of these prior cases that I've just been mentioning. So we've seen what built up to Roe. And then if we continue on after Roe, the building continues. The very next year, there was a case that struck down forced maternity leave for teachers and cited all of those prior cases as well as Roe. A few years later, uh, an ordinance that prevented intergenerational families from living together cited Roe, as well as these other cases. The court further developed its jurisprudence around contraception and marriage, and in 1990 held that there is a basic right to refuse medical treatment, so bodily autonomy, citing, again, all of those cases, including Roe. And then, of course, we get to uh, the cases that I'm sure this community is um, deeply concerned about, and we're going to talk about further, the 2003 case of Lawrence versus Texas, which struck down sodomy laws, also cited Roe, as well as some of these other cases. And then in 2015, we got the Obergefell decision, um, recognizing the right to marriage equality in the Constitution, and again, citing uh, many of these other decisions that I just mentioned. So that was a lot, but in, in some ways, the repetition is the point that Roe is not the beginning and it's not the end, and it doesn't stand alone in this doctrine. It is part of a pre existing and subsequently developed liberty doctrine as a source of substantive rights. And as we've seen, Roe is cited in many cases are not even about abortion. There's a through line in these cases about personal and family autonomy and privacy that are implied in the guarantee of liberty in the Constitution. 
So while abortion is unique in certain ways, we should really be emphasizing how much it fits into this tradition and that it is an anomaly and a departure from this tradition to rule that a pregnant person lacks the individual autonomy to decide whether to bear a child. Now, the fact that the Dobbs opinion overruled Roe doesn't mean that all of those other rights I just mentioned instantly disappear. For example, marriage equality was also based on the guarantee of equal protection in the Constitution. It does pull away a, a substantial part of that tradition. And the dissent in Dobbs uh, actually used the analogy of the Jenga game. If you pull out a piece, there's a great risk that many other pieces fall with it. So turning to the Dobbs decision, let's see what actually happened on Friday. And even that needs to be put into some recent context. There have been attacks on, attacks on the right to abortion ever since Roe was decided in 1973, but they really, really shot up after the 2010 elections when um, a certain political party took control of many state legislatures. Hundreds of laws in the last dozen or so years have been passed restricting, restricting abortion and they come in all kinds of types. There are what are known as trap laws, targeted regulation of abortion providers that are onerous regulations designed to shut clinics down and make them impossible to operate. Biased counseling laws that literally make physicians and other providers lie to women about the risks of abortion. There are waiting periods. There are rules saying that you can only get an abortion in a hospital or only from a physician. And there are laws that literally say that after an abortion, the fetal remains have to be cremated and buried. Um, and then there are also limits on uh, how long in a pregnant, how far along in a pregnancy a person can get an abortion. And that's the kind of law that was at issue in the case on Friday, the Dobbs case. Mississippi passed a ban on abortion after 15 weeks of pregnancy, which is well before the viability line, which had been up until now, the point um, after which a state could ban abortion, but it couldn't before that. So at first, the state of Mississippi uh, sought review from the court and just said, you don't need to overturn Roe, we just want you to uphold our 15 week ban and say that it's okay to have bans on abortion before viability. But they did a bait and switch. Once the Supreme Court decided to take the case, when they did their merits briefing to the court on the actual issues at stake, they said, you know what, actually, we do want you to overturn Roe and this is a perfect opportunity to do it. So what happened in the actual opinion on Friday? As you probably know, Supreme Court decisions off often come in multiple parts. So the majority opinion, which is the opinion for the court and what is the actual outcome, was joined by five of the nine justices. So Justice Alito and Justices Thomas, Gorsuch, Kavanaugh, and Barrett. The essential holding in the case on Friday was that if a right isn't in the text of the Constitution and it's not part of uh, deeply rooted traditions and history, then it doesn't exist. And the court said, because abortion was not deeply rooted in our country's history and tradition, it is not a right protected by the Constitution. And it spends a lot of time focusing on the state of the law around abortion when the 14th Amendment was ratified, which was in 1868. So the court then said, tries to assure us that this case is only about abortion, that's the only thing affecting, affected by its reasoning, and it will not affect things like intimacy and marriage equality. But the legal reasoning that they used to strike down Roe could easily apply to any of those other rights. Now, as Imani touched on earlier, Justice Thomas concurred in the decision and said the quiet part out loud. He said, you know what, that entire line of cases where the court has read into the constitution certain rights based on basic guarantees of liberty, that was all nonsense and we should get rid of all together but there are three specific cases he mentioned, as Imani said, the Griswold case guaranteeing the right to contraception, the Lawrence case striking down sodomy laws, and Obergefell, which guaranteed marriage equality. Justice Kavanaugh also wrote his own separate concurring opinion where he tried to come across as a little bit more reasonable than some of the other justices. He said, you know what, people are divided on abortion, and so the court really shouldn't take sides. We're just gonna let the states decide and leave it up to the democratic process. He also tried to reassure us that none of the other rights that we've been talking about are at issue. Justice Roberts, Chief Justice Roberts, wrote a concurring opinion in which he only occur concurred in the outcome of the case. So he basically said, yes, I would uphold the Mississippi law because I think a 15 week ban on abortion is okay but the court did not need to overturn Roe to do that. And it really shouldn't have done that because there is a, sort of a canon of what, how the Supreme Court operates in which they say, don't do more than we have to. So we, he says we should have upheld the Mississippi law, but did not need to go as far as overturning Roe. 
And he said that the majority opinion is a serious jolt to the legal system, which is a bit of an understatement, but I agree with him on that. And then finally, the dissent, which I would encourage anyone to read, contains some really strong language. So this was Justice Breyer, uh, Sotomayor, and Justice Kagan. The dissent used very, very strong language. Um, dissents often do, but I think some of the, the things that the dissent said in this case are worth noting. They said that now from the moment of fertilization, a woman has no rights to speak of. They talk in terms of forced pregnancy, which I also agree with. And they said that either the mass of the majority's opinion is hypocrisy or additional constitutional rights are under threat. It is one or the other. And they called out the reason why this is even happening right now. They said the court reverses course today for one reason and one reason only, because the composition of this court has changed. The dissent leans hard into the fact that Roe is in fact part of that broad tradition of recognizing fundamental personal rights. And it's, it says the, the assurances of the majority that other rights are at risk are not at risk ring hollow. The other thing that the dissent does that I think is very important is it really lambastes the majority for paying no attention to the real world impact on people that this decision, this decision is going to have. Because now we are literally now in a situation in which abortion access is going to vary widely across the country. Uh, low, income women will, no, low income women will essentially have no rights because they will not have the ability to travel outside of their state in order to attain abortion care, which means that Many women will suffer health consequences and some will die either from pregnancy itself or from unsafe abortion methods. So that's what happened on Friday. And at this point, I'm gonna turn it over to Shannon, our legal director to delve a little bit more into what this may mean for the LGBTQ community specifically. Thanks, Julie. Um, I mean, I am really searching for the right words here. I can say, I feel like I have not seen a more serious moment facing our community, many communities, women, LGBTQ people, people of color. Look, we are, we are as not just as a result of Dobbs decision, but the Dobbs decision has made it unmistakably clear, as clear as it possibly could be that we're, I mean, we are on notice now. We are fighting for our place in this country. We're fighting for our families. We're fighting for democracy at the most basic level. And we're fighting for the most basic liberties and freedoms. A court that would do what the Supreme Court just did in Dobbs will do anything. And that is one of a series of very radical decisions the court is making, including one today about school prayer. They are radically rewriting our constitutional jurisprudence to eliminate the most important personal freedoms that have been recognized for decades, including the right to reproductive autonomy. And now on the chopping block, no question about it. It's in the decision in black and white. They have now called into question the legitimacy of Griswold, the right to contraception. They're literally suggesting the right to contraception is no longer secure. Lawrence, the right to enter into an intimate relationship with another adult and Obergefell, the right to marriage equality. Um, I think that, I mean, Julie, you laid out, you laid out the decisions. Look, what I, what I, all the concurring opinions and the dissent and all that, but what I really want to stress to everyone is we need to listen to the dissenting justices. Look, this court is a very conservative court. It was a very conservative court, even when Justice Kennedy was, was on the court, even when Justice Ginsburg was on the court, I mean, she was at one, one end of the spectrum. It is now, it is a court that has been hijacked, three appointments by President Trump, every single one of them illegitimate for a different reason. I mean, this is an institution that has lost its kind of institutional integrity and credibility. And it is now, it's got a majority of hyper right-wing justices who are doing what they were put on the court to do, which is stripping our, 
us and others of basic freedoms. And the justices in the dissent in the, who wrote the dissenting opinion are not, they are very moderate. Uh, they are not want to raise alarms for, for no reasons, for no reason. And the le I, if you have not had a chance to read the dissent, you really should because they do not pull any punches. They're telling, they're, it is a, a warning in great big neon letters that the court is coming after additional rights and freedoms very much, including contraception, the right to sexual freedom and marriage equality. I mean, the question has been called. Uh, and as, as Julie pointed out and the dissent points out, there are some very uh, cursory assurances in the majority opinion, like, oh, don't worry. Uh, we're not, you know, this is really different than Griswold and Lawrence and Obergefell. Don't be silly. We're not coming after those. But as the dissent points out, the entire reasoning of the majority opinion is very simple. It's, cr it's actually very crude. The entire basis of the majority opinion is that if rights were not recognized, if a right was not recognized as fundamental in 1868, when the 14th Amendment was ratified, then it will not, this court will not recognize it as a fundamental right in 2022. The only thing they say that supposedly makes Roe different is that unlike the right, these other rights of contraception, sexual freedom, marriage equality, there's no uh, potential life at stake on the other side. But as the dissent points out, that, that has absolutely nothing to do with their legal reasoning. They don't rely on that. Their legal reasoning doesn't rest on that in any way at all. Their legal reasoning rests 100% on this absurd approach to the Constitution that if a right was not recognized in 1868, it's not protected today. That would apply to all contraception, sexual freedom, marriage equality. So why in the world should we have any assurance at all that those rights are not going to be eviscerated the same way they just eviscerated Roe? Uh, I just want to flag some of the very clear language from the dissent. No one should be confident that this majority is done with its work. We cannot understand how anyone can be confident that today's opinion will be the last of its kind. I mean, we are fully on notice and that more is coming and that this court is not going to protect our rights. They're not going to do it. The most likely way is will happen, and I, and I think this will be a combination of what the strategy that led to the reversal of Roe, which was decades of chipping away at the right to abortion by states passing ever more burdensome restrictions and seeing how far they could push. On the one hand, on the other hand, what we have seen with the attacks on transgender youth, which is a tsunami of vicious lies, misinformation, fear mongering, flooding the country uh, with anti-trans legislation of the, and then a competition to see who can come up with the most extreme versions of those laws. So I think that we're going to see a confluence of those two strategies, and it will not take decades like it did to reverse row. It's going to be highly accelerated. I think we're going to see immediately red states passing laws to try to undermine the equality of married same-sex couples. We are already seeing uh, red states passing laws that attempt to strip transgender people of health care. Um, those are already happening, and th and those in in the the frightening language that was in the decision in Dobbs bodes very ill for our challenges to those laws. I mean, the court basically says, "Hey, if you want to regulate anything to do with uh, health care, it's just rational basis." And one part of the decision, Julie, they didn't uh, flag um, too much. I think was the court's equal protection analysis. The court goes out of its way to say, to reject any argument 
that restrictions of abortion could be understood as sex discrimination and therefore we could have equal protection arguments relating to abortion. The court just brushes those away with the back of his hands like, nope, mm -mm, no, we reject that, um, which is going to really make some of our arguments around challenging laws that restrict healthcare for transgender people very difficult. I mean, we are really in a terribly dire and grim situation. Anyway, I think what we'll see is red states enacting more laws targeting transgender people and now enacting laws that that under the quality of married same-sex couples. We already have legislators in some states uh, even Senator Adams from Utah, who has been, relatively speaking, fairly supportive of LGBTQ equality in that state, he didn't waste a minute in coming out with a public statement that he would not be upset to see the Supreme Court reverse Obergefell. And that's Utah. That's not even one of the deepest red states. Um, so I think we're, we will see states treating married same-sex couples differently, less favorably. Uh, we'll see it in the area probably of parental rights, most especially maybe adoption. And then we'll have to go in and challenge those. Uh, we're facing a very hostile federal judiciary now and a very hostile Supreme Court. So we will do our part. NCLR, other litigation groups will certainly do our part, do everything we can to fight this attack on our families and our freedom, uh, our right to exist when it comes to transgender people in the courts, we will. But I think one of the big message, messages that we wanted to convey to all of you listening today is that the courts are not going to be enough to protect us and that we have got to go all out to put pressure on every elected official at every level to stand up for fundamental freedoms, for LGBTQ people, for women, for voting rights. At the federal level, we've got to put an, as much pressure as we possibly can on both parties to eliminate the filibuster, at least for voting rights and for Supreme Court reform. And we've got to have Supreme Court reform. If we don't, if, if the Supreme Court does not see in response to the outrageous decision they just issued. If they don't see an upswelling of public anger, and if they don't hear the message loud and clear that you, we will not be pushed back, there's gonna be no stopping them whatsoever. There's encouraging polling in the, in the that was reported this morning that actually it seems that a majority of the country is angry about the Dobbs decision, which was really good to see. But we have a short window of time here to capitalize on that. We can't, we can't be two weeks from now where no one remembers this. So, I mean, I wish, as I, then when I said at the beginning, I, I wish I knew the exact right words to reach everyone listening to this today. And then we have got to reach a much broader audience. We've got to mobilize in a way we have not had to do in our lifetimes, or we are going to be facing a world of hurt and pain. And we already are. Amani, as you pointed out, we the, the, the impact right now on millions of women who are seriously suffering now because of the, the right to abortion is gone in more than half the country is very real. And look, we've got to all link arms, stand together and fight like hell in a way that we really have not, has not been, we have not been called on to do at least in my lifetime. Thank you so much. Appreciate um, both of your words here. I want to give an opportunity to um, for questions. Let me see. We have one from Iris. Okay, wonderful. Okay, let's see. So I'm looking at this. Um, Wait, is there one you see, Shannon? Yeah, the one I see is from Iris Gonzalez. Uh, how can we communicate this information to people who are not as familiar with constitutional law and who will be voting in state and federal elections? It's so crucial for them to understand what happened and what will continue to happen if we don't make changes. 
Yes, I could not agree more, Iris. I mean, we're, you know, I mean, we can just say a few things we're doing. Uh, Amani and Julie, you know, weigh in. We're 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 going to be coming out, you know, with a, a public statement supporting Supreme Court reform. Uh, we hope other LGBT legal groups and other civil rights groups will be doing the same. Uh, we're going to be writing as many op-eds as we can churn out as quickly and continuously as we can. Uh, we're going to be doing as much organizing of other LGBT groups and um, state equality groups as we possibly can. Um, what else, uh, Julie and Amani? I mean, we're, um, we want to work as closely with the administration as possible, get as many meetings as we can with folks from the White House. We need, you know, um, our lives really do depend on this. And I think, you know, Shannon's doing a really um, great job of talking about how important it is in this moment. Right now, if we don't do things right now, there, there could be a situation where we don't have any moves left. We don't have any choices. And so we are using absolutely everything at our disposal um, to get anything that we can, because what's happening right now um, is absolutely unheard of, but we should be, but we should be afraid. Um, and so um, there is nothing off the table. And I, there is another question in the chat that I think builds on what Shannon was just discussing about court reform, since the leaked opinion didn't change their, their minds, why, why, how is being angry now going to do that? I mean, the, the truth is there's nothing, there's nothing magic about the number nine as far as Supreme Court justices and Congress can change that. So the court has been, um, as, as Shannon said, several of the seats were essentially hijacked. So there's no reason why, other than politics, Congress can't add seats to the Supreme Court. That's one of the proposals that's probably most been talked about. That would just take legislative action. But of course, there would need to be change to the Senate rules because right, right now we have to get to 60 votes to get anything done. So a precursor step would be to change that rule so that at least certain things would not be subject to that threshold anymore. So that's where political pressure comes in because there are even... Um, we are obviously a nonpartisan organization, but there, there's a, one party that is probably more likely to want to engage in some of these reforms, but even a couple of those senators are reluctant to get rid of the filibuster. They need to hear loud and clear that it's not okay anymore. This is not a time for small steps. We need bold action because what the court is doing is so far afield from where the country is. It, it's, it's time to, to go big. And we have to remember, this isn't the first time that something like this has happened. You know, um, on our team, we were talking about uh, it was in 1937 um, that uh, when the Supreme Court said that the Social Security Act was un unconstitutional, FDR wasn't asking for people to um, to vote in the next election. He told the court that he was just going to add more justices until they backed off. And so this is also something not unheard of. I don't want you know. I just want to want to share. This is. Um, where we are right where we are right now it's something that in some ways we've seen it before and so and so there are to certainly nothing's off the table um we are definitely in, in favor of anything of of radical solutions but we also want to want to name that this is not the first time that things like this have happened and that every solution that we uh, that we will be going for they're not all they're not all radical these are all things that have been some of these things are going to be things that have been done before i think that's an important thing to say this is not this won't be just people going rogue because um we don't particularly care for um, for a particular decision. Um, this is actually talking about our democracy and um, freedom and equity that um, seems to be something that this court isn't paying close attention to. I will, I will stop there. <laughs> well, there's some questions coming in. Um, one is how we best affect Supreme Court reform? Who do we pressure? Leadership in Congress and your federal representatives. We should all be calling them as often and as vigorously as possible and demanding that they take action now, you know, and that bipartisan, but, you know, yes, we need to, the leadership needs to do that. Um, and they, you know, they don't hear from people. And so they need to hear from us on that relentlessly. And then there's really good questions. Milan, thank you. You're asking about the impact of potential reversal of broker fell on existing marriage and parent marriages and parentage determinations. And Milan, you and I talked about this this issue recently. And when we spoke, um, I was not less worried about Obergefell being subject to reversal. And so you're probably noticing I am now worried. I mean, we have to be now. I mean, I I am I was shocked. At, I was shocked by the that Justice Thomas said the quiet part out loud, 
in his concurring opinion that he is clearly inviting red states to attack Obergefell and that the tepid reassurances in the majority opinion and the Kavanaugh concurrence are so tepid and so implausible. And then the dissenters are telling us, don't believe them. Like, do not believe it. So anyway, I'm going to, I just want to, I want to acknowledge to, to you that um, I'm in a different place than when we last talked. That said, I do think that it will be very difficult uh, the last thing they will probably go after is to try to undo existing marriages. I think the focus in red states will be on trying to stop people from being able to marry going forward. But then also with respect to existing marriages, I think they'll try to just they'll try to establish that it's okay to treat same sex couples who are already married differently than different sex couples who are married. And I think uh, they'll try to do, I do think it will be the most inviting target for them is probably gonna be around stuff relating to parental rights. I think that married same-sex couples who have children, this is advice we have already given, but now the advice takes on a lot of added weight. We have always said, don't rely on your marriage to establish your parental rights. You go get an adoption or get a parentage judgment to make absolutely sure that no one can later challenge your, your legal parentage and that it is risky to rely on the marital presumption is the family law term of art that you don't wanna, you wanna be sure. But boy, that is like a hundred times more true now. Like, the most urgent thing that married same-sex couples with children should be doing right now, if you haven't already, is to get secure both parents' parental rights through an adoption or a parentage judgment. Um, because I'm we're already we have, this is a fight we're already fighting in a number of states uh, where a lot of states are reluctant to apply the same rule to same-sex couples who have kids is that they apply to heterosexual parents married parents who have kids. If you're straight, you have, you're married, you have kids, you're both legal parents. There's a pretty strong presumption of that. And that a lot of states are reluctant to apply that same presumption to married same sex couples. We've had to litigate that issue until I litigated that issue in so many states already. And it's just, it's gonna get worse now. It's gonna get worse. Um, so that's probably the single most important thing. Yeah, let's see. Um, there's someone asking, um, can someone explain why Roe was not codified into federal law and what that actually means? Well, we've tried. Um, I mean, Roe was based on the constitution. So you can't literally codify Roe in terms of what it held because what Roe said is that the constitution already protects a right to abortion, but there is federal legislation that would create well, legislatively, a right to access abortion care and a right for providers to provide abortion care. It's called the Women's Health Protection Act. The House of Representatives did pass that bill last September. They were inspired to vote on it after Texas enacted their crazy vigilante abortion ban. The Senate voted on that bill in February. It did not meet that 60 vote threshold that we need now because of the filibuster. After the leaked opinion came out in the Dobbs case in May, the Senate held a second vote on the Women's Health Protection Act. Again, it still didn't meet the 60 vote threshold. Now, whether that would be different now after the real opinion came out, I don't know. I think it probably still wouldn't get to 60, but there is, there is a way to create a right to abortion through Congress if it had the political will. And I actually just in response to an earlier question, people said, what can we do right now? One of the things is, is, is to still tell your senators that you want them to vote for that, for that bill. Because Senator Schumer could bring it up again. Uh, thanks, Shannon's writing some answers in the, um, uh, in the chat. I did see that on Matt out as well. Um, uh, she was saying to, you know, if you are in a same sex uh, marriage that you may want to think about uh, 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 looking at other options to protect yourself. And Shannon saying that's a, uh, a good idea. Um, let's see. Abby, thank you so much for the support. Um, let's see. 
Am I missing anything? Help me with the chat. I'm not... Sure. I mean, there's so many. Que- there's a lot of questions, uh, Elizabeth. You ask about um, what do we do about Lawrence if they reverse Lawrence? Is there anything we can do to protect ourselves against that? I mean, if there, if some states try to go back to criminalizing same-sex intimacy. The only thing I know, I mean, I don't think there's any legal documents you can execute to protect yourself against that. We just have to fight like hell. I mean, we cannot let this happen. I mean, it is, I can't even believe that we are, I cannot believe that the U.S. Supreme Court in 2022 just issued an opinion that stripped women of the most fundamental, like forcing women to carry children to term and saying, oh, by the way, we may, uh, we may reverse this landmark decision that says that states can't criminalize adult sexual intimacy between people who choose to, you know, have sexual relations with each other. I mean, we're look like we're like this far from living in Gilead here, people. I mean, we have got to seriously mobilize again. Sorry. I know I just keep saying that, but like, we really, really, really do i mean and i hope i know people who are on this call are thought leaders and that you have big networks and i hope that um i hope that you will help us alert people spread the word that we've this is really serious Well, you know, Doma is still in the books. Somebody just, sorry, sorry, Deborah just asked about what, if, if, if they reverse Obergefell, are they going to reverse Windsor, which struck down the Federal Defense of Marriage Act? That act is still in the books, congressionally. That should be repealed. Um, and yes, if, if some states manage to undo, you know, reverse Obergefell and we're back this world. It looks like we lost Shannon. Um, we'll get him to finish up when he gets a chance. Um, we're going to follow the chaos for, for businesses. Uh, Shannon, you cut out for about 20 seconds there. Let's just do a quick recap. Yeah, I'm, yeah so sorry. I hate my internet mad. I was just saying um, that the, the, the Federal Defense of Marriage Act is still on the books. That needs to be repealed. And that if some states do reverse or try to fail, we could be back in that world where you're married in some states, not married in others. Uh, And, you know, it's gonna, the legal difficulties and the result from that is just incalculable. So let's better to go all out now to try to stop this rather than, than, you know, one, I mean, have nothing but admiration and respect for the reproductive justice this lesson we have to take is that ignore these early warning signs it is so the more we can the more strongly we can react now we will be in the long run and we just can't wait to be like the frogs boiled in the watch as our equality and and ability to participate is equal eroded bit by bit Wonderful. Um, Dorothy, I see your question. Um, uh, need to ch- uh, challenge Thomas about why he doesn't think loving should be un- overturned. You know, I think this is just an example of how um, this uh, this does not feel objective. I think is another sort of frustration that we're that we're feeling as well. Um, uh, it definitely seems like, uh, in his concurring opinion, that he has sort of picked things that uh, he doesn't feel as as closely um, related to. Um, I was going to say for, you know, when we think about court reform, what are, uh, uh, who do we pressure? You know, I think that we are, I think, um, I think that we, I think that we reach out to everyone, but there's also really great organizations that have been trying to do this for a number of years. And I think um, first steps will actually be working with these organizations to partner uh, and and uh, to not reinvent the wheel and start and uh, jumping on and supporting these groups that have already been been doing this important work. Um, we don't stand anything to lose right now. Honestly, I think we have to, you know, we need to leave everything on the field, put everything on the table, every analogy that you can come up with. Um, we don't, we, 
um, you know, the only way that we end up looking stupid here is honestly just not doing anything and watching as as things just um, as as we have fewer and few, fewer freedoms. Um, I think this this Friday has been incredibly telling about where we are um, and uh, what our leadership looks like. You know, one thing, Amani, I would say too, I'm feeling a little, I don't know, I guess conflicted is the right word because on the one hand, I think it's really important. And I think some folks in the chat have alluded to this, that getting involved at the state level is going to be essential now because this is where the attacks are coming from. And this is where protections can also be enacted. I don't, I think we can't write off the red states where we assume that all these rights are going to disappear. There are people living in those states who don't agree with this and they, and, and folks need to get involved, you know, down at, at that level. At the same time, I'm thinking about what the dissent said, which is absolutely right. These fundamental rights should not even be subject to the democratic process. That is in fact, the point of having a constitution that guarantees fundamental rights. So while I'm saying get involved, you know, electorally and at the grassroots in your state and get these these things recodified into your state law, it shouldn't have to be that way. The, the whole point of having a constitution with a liberty guarantee is that our rights are not up for debate on, are not up to vote by somebody else. But that's essentially what Justice Alito said in his opinion, let the states decide, Justice Kavanaugh said too. And they, they make it sound like that's the neutral option. Putting it back in the hands of the states is the neutral option. The court just wants to watch it, wash its hands of the issue but that is not going to happen. If anything, they have just opened up a whole new can of worms of legal issues about things like traveling across state lines. Can, can states criminalize their citizens when they travel? And as Shannon alluded to, those same issues are gonna dog us when it comes to access to care for transgender kids, transgender adults. What does it mean if states try to reach beyond their borders and, and control what people do if they do try to get to a blue state? And that's only for people who can even do that. As, as was mentioned earlier, I'm just, my heart is broken today for the people who find themselves facing an unattended pregnancy and their options were just stolen from them. And that should not be the state of play in the United States in 2022. Thank you so much, Julie. I really appreciate that. And absolutely true. And, you know, it's a scary time and we need to do absolutely everything we can. Uh, let's see. Some folks are asking about how to get involved in the court reform effort and Ames helpfully put the link for demand justice. There's also take back the court. Um, and I was gonna try to find the link to that. Maybe somebody else who's quicker. Well, can I, I have it, I have it, okay. yeah. <laughs> and there it is. And as you said, Imani, I think we need to make sure people know this isn't you know, some idea that, that came from Mars. I mean, the court has not always been nine justices. You don't have to amend the constitution to change the number of justices. There are some really good reasons, even beyond the fact that the court is so out of touch to do this because the workload of the court is, is more than it can handle. There are some, these organizations have done some really good thinking about why it actually makes a lot of sense for so many reasons to have potentially, you know, 13 rather than nine justices on the Supreme Court. So really encourage folks to get familiar with those arguments and then take it up with the people that you sent to Congress. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, well, someone's asking about how will changing the number of justices um, change the holding in, in Dobbs. Um, I mean that won't it won't it won't change it in that moment. You know, honestly, it would be part of it would be part of a larger effort that we have to win this back. You know, we've we won this before. We'll we'll win it again. This you know um, this is going to be part of a larger effort because even if we were to um, add another you know four justices to the court, um, I don't know that it would necessarily you, you know you never know how these things work, but you know off first blush i don't see i don't see a huge change there but what's happening right here and this this super majority any super majority is not doing justice for um the folks in this country and the the court currently is very much out of step with how the majority of the country um thinks these des decisions should go um and i mean the way that we saw um, the justices from the courts lobbying earlier just about how this isn't partisan and how just what we're seeing from this particular court is um, 
it's unheard of. <laughs> um, it, and a change in the court is not is not a bad one. So no, this would not this would not change this particular instance, but um, it would put us, you know, um, it puts us in a better um, position as we're as we're moving forward. Okay, anything else? Sorry if we've missed anything. If there's a question you have that hasn't been answered, please do um, pop it in the chat. I'm trying to keep up with that. Can you provide language we can use for contacting representatives? I've never done anything like this before and I'm not sure how, um, how to get it done. I have some ideas, but I actually would love to open it to our, our lawyers first. I think we can certainly do that. I, I said earlier in the chat, somebody had said, you know, what are three things we can do now? And one thing, because I know we're talking a lot about the knock on effects of this decision, but I also don't want us to lose sight of what actually happened on Friday and who it's going to hurt. And right now, people, people who need abortion care need help. Um, and those providing care need help. And there are organizations who are well equipped to do that, but they need resources. So um, I going to assume uh, our development folks can help us with this, but those of you who are here today, we can send follow-up materials afterwards with links to those organizations if you wanna help people get to the care they need. And then also we can include, you know, how to advocate with your um, members of Congress, particularly the Senate, because that's where kind of everything dies now uh, because of the rules that they have there. So we do wanna be a resource to you. And we've done this before, Well, we, we might even consider setting up a, a resource page. We have something um, where we can, set it up so all you have to do is put in your name and we can do the language for you and it'll send a message to, to your members of Congress. So um, I'm seeing nodding. So I'm guessing that I think we're gonna, we're gonna do that. So we will we'll do everything we can to help make it easy, easy for you. So thank you for that question. That's wonderful. And you know, when you are calling the folks that are representing you to remind them that to let them know that you are in their district, that um, they are representing you, what's going on for you. Um, personal stories are really helpful uh, and tell them, you know, what's happening for you, why you need the support that you need, why you're asking for this. Um, that actually does go uh, further than you might think. This is especially true when we're trying to change the minds of people. Um, even when you are in uh, spaces that are supportive of what you're sharing, they like to hear that as well. Very often, we don't, um, the, uh, the issues that we push forward don't often hear, um, senators and elected officials don't often hear at the same numbers, and it's really important that we push those things out. I think that's um, a good point, Imani, too. I think sometimes people feel like it's intimidating to call Congress because, oh, they're, they're members of Congress, but they work for you. And I think you, you alluded to that just a moment ago, Imani. These people work for you. You might not have voted for them, so you might not have sent those specific people to Congress, but they need to hear from you. And while we will provide some resources um, and some tools to help you afterwards, it's actually really, really easy, as Shannon said in the chat. I'm putting the number of the Capitol switchboard in the chat and literally you just say where you're from and they will connect you to your members of Congress. And all you need to do is say, you know, I'm outraged by what the Supreme Court just did. We need legislative action, do it now. Pass the Women's Health Protection Act, get rid of the filibuster, expand the court. It'd take you about 30 seconds. Thank you. And Milan, thank you so much for the question. This is always true. You know, I think always organizations are saying that they need more funding. Um, this is very true for us right now. It's especially true because the work that we've all already been doing doesn't go away and we actually need to continue that, but we do need to focus efforts here and it has to be NCLR that's focusing efforts here. Um, you know, our long history uh, doing family law, our long incredible history with marriage equality, our intersectional look at understanding reproductive justice and LGBTQ um, and LGBTQ justice, uh, all of these things combined, these are things that put NCLR on the map. These, the reasons that people know about NCLR are because of these things right here. And so if ever there was an organization to be leading here, it is NCLR. And that is really important. You know, NCLR is an organization that works very 
very well in coalition. We are not the people that say, oh, hey, this was us. Oh, hey, this was us. But if we look at all the things that we're talking about, the rights that are that are leaving right now, this was us. So it's not that we're just, oh, we're just halfway doing this kind of stuff. The things that are that are being cut right now are things that absolutely NCLR NTLR was doing these were our these were our cases, you know, Obergefell was our hates of the, the work that we do for reproductive justice, reproductive rights, keeping families together. This was NTLR before this was anyone else. And so um, thank you so much for, for saying that. I want you to know that we are working um, to find some more funding for these types of things, too, because if ever there was an organization to be doing it, it's, it's NCLR right now in this moment. Hey, I think we are, let's see, I'm gonna get one more. Thank you so much, everyone. We really appreciate you. Um, please don't hesitate to reach out if you have any um, questions. We are happy to get back to um, get back to you. Oh, thanks so much, yes, re, uh, resist bot. Um, yes, the recording will be available. We are working on getting that either up later this afternoon or early tomorrow. So it'll be on our YouTube page. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Shannon saying that um, his main worry is that people won't recognize um, how immediate and serious these threats are. Um, yeah. Um, tell everyone you can. We actually like we we are fighting for our lives right now. We we are fighting for our lives right now. Um, I wish that we could say that this was not a big deal. That is honestly, and I. Um, it is never, you know, NCLR is never the organization that is sounding the alarm every time something comes up to fundraise off of it. Like that is not us. We are we are saying this now because it is and it's important. And if we don't do something now, we might not have an opportunity to do something later. Um, it's time to fight, y'all. We appreciate you all so much. Um, yeah, so uh, reach out if we can do anything. NCLrights.org. Um, you can reach out to any of us in particular. All of us. Um, all of our emails are on the website. Reach out if, if we can do anything and know that we're fighting for you. Appreciate you all so much. Thanks, everyone.